Hey everyone, ready to dive into something really impactful. We're tackling BPD, borderline personality disorder, and inpatient treatment that gets real results. Absolutely. We're exploring Kathy Stringer's research, effective inpatient treatment, and the amelioration of the Therapeutic Alliance for Resistive Individuals with BPD. It's a mouthful, but trust me, it's good stuff. Really insightful research. And to make it even better, we're bringing in a real life success story from Jen Slade, a nurse who put Stringer's findings into action. Having that clinical perspective really brings the research to life. Totally. So before we get into the details, can you paint a picture of what makes BPD treatment, especially in inpatient settings, so challenging? Well, imagine this. Someone with BPD enters treatment and they start projecting feelings from their past onto, say, their therapist. We call this transference. Like they just can't help it. All right, it's unconscious. Say they had a really controlling parent they might start seeing that same controlling behavior in the therapist, even if it's not actually there. It's like our own baggage, you know? We see things through that lens. Exactly. And here's the thing. It's not just one-sided. Therapists are human, too. Oh, for sure. They have their own history, their own stuff. So they might react to a patient based on their unresolved issues. That's countertransference. Two sides of the same coin, in a way. It reminds me of this boss I had. She reminded me so much of this super critical teacher from high school. I projected so much onto her, you know. Turned out she was just a very direct person. But all that drama was my baggage, not actually her. And that actually leads us to another important aspect, splitting. Right, splitting. It's like seeing things in black and white, right? Yeah. In BPD, people often see things as all good or all bad. No middle ground. So they might go back and forth with the people around them, like idealizing someone one minute and then seeing them as the enemy the next. Exactly. And that can make things really hard for treatment, for the whole team, because the consistency is so disrupted. Wow. You know what I find really interesting about all this? It's not just about BPD. Haven't we all experienced that black and white thinking when we're really stressed? It's like everyone's either with us or against us. We've all been there. BPD just seems to magnify it. Which is why I'm eager to unpack how Stringer suggests navigating all this. It's like, it's amplified, right? And that's where Stringer's research goes beyond just pointing out the challenges. She gives yeah. us a framework for understanding how healing can actually happen, even within these really intense dynamics. Okay, I'm intrigued. Tell me more. It all comes down to this concept of projective identification. Projective identification, huh? Sounds pretty complicated. Well, it's a three-step process. Okay, so first, picture a patient they're carrying all this anger, maybe from trauma in their past. Heavy stuff. Right. So through projective identification, they're unconsciously trying to get rid of that anger, projecting it outward. Onto the therapist. Exactly. And the thing is, the therapist might not have done anything to provoke it. Wow. So they're suddenly hit with this wave of anger that isn't even theirs. That's got to be so disorienting. Absolutely. And it gets even trickier. The next part is called projective counter-identification. Now the therapist, without even realizing it, gets hooked by that projected anger. Fuck. Yeah, they start feeling agitated, irritable, maybe acting in ways that are totally out of character for them. It's like their own emotions are betraying them if they're not careful. So this is where the third part comes in, right? Hmm. Where Stringer brings in the magic of transformation. You got it. The third part, introjective identification. This is where the therapist, instead of getting swept up in that anger, provides a healthy container for it. So they're not denying it or pushing it away. Right. They're holding space for it, but in a way that's actually therapeutic. It's like okay. they're detoxifying the anger mm -hmm. and then reflecting back a calmer, more regulated version to the patient. And the patient, for maybe the first time, is experiencing what it feels like to have their emotions acknowledged and validated in a healthy way. Wow, that's powerful. And it's not about managing behavior. It's about creating the conditions for deep, real healing to take place. I love that. It reminds me of what Jen Slade wrote about her experience putting this into practice. Oh, yeah. Her letter is amazing. Yeah. Talk about real world application. There's this one part that really stood out to me. She's talking about the impact this approach had on a young patient. She says, the impact for our client was immediate. Because the team felt more confident, they responded more positively towards her. Because my client felt less rejected and more accepted, her confidence grew and she was able to develop more positive relationships with each of her team. I mean, that's just incredible. It really shows how powerful this shift can be. <laughs> and it's not just theoretical. It creates this ripple effect of healing for the patient and everyone around them. Like that saying, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Right. 
That human connection makes all the difference. It really is about the connection, right? And when you have that that genuine care, that's where you can start building ego strength. And Stringer talks about going beyond just managing the symptoms, like with DBT skills training, for example. So it's more than just coping mechanisms. Yeah, it's about getting to the root of it, reshaping those internal structures that are driving those behaviors. Think of it like this. Someone with BPD, they might be doing okay when their emotions are stable. Makes sense. But then something triggers those core wounds, those deep-seated insecurities, and their internal resources just aren't there. Ah, I see. Like they don't have the tools to deal with it. Right. It's like having a weak foundation. You build something on top of it. It looks fine. But the first storm that comes along, it's all going to come crashing down. And that's where those maladaptive coping mechanisms kick in. Exactly. The splitting, the projective identification. Right. Right. Desperate attempts to regain some sense of control. And that's where Stringer's work is so crucial. She's saying we can do more than just manage those reactions. We can actually help the patient build a more resilient sense of self. And that takes time, right? And a lot of self-awareness. I mean, Stringer talks about that a lot, the therapist's own self-awareness. They have to be so careful not to bring their own baggage into the room, right? Oh, absolutely. This work, it takes a lot of empathy, patience, and a willingness to get uncomfortable. But as Stringer highlights, and Slade's letter just beautifully illustrates, the rewards are immeasurable. Yeah. You're creating a space for real healing, for real growth, mm -hmm. not just putting a Band-Aid on the symptoms. Powerful stuff. And you know what? I think there's something in there for all of us, even if we're not therapists working with BPD. It makes you think about how we show up in all our relationships. Absolutely. Can we hold space for each other with more empathy, more understanding? Can we be curious instead of judgmental? So as we wrap up this deep dive, here's a final thought for everyone listening. Imagine you're designing the perfect inpatient treatment program for someone with BPD. What would you prioritize? What could that healing space look like? Such a great question to consider. And remember, these insights, they're not just for clinicians. They can transform the way we approach all our relationships. So true. Until next time, everyone, keep asking those insightful questions. Stay curious. We'll be back soon with another deep dive into a topic that matters.